uh, Michael Kennedy um, giving us a talk. Uh, he is a technologist, podcaster, and entrepreneur. He is the host and founder of the two most popular Python podcasts, Talk Python to Me and Python Bytes. He teaches online courses for developers through his business, Talk Python Training. So with that, Michael, take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's, it's great to be here with you. I hope to inspire you just a little bit to write more Pythonic code. So let's start this discussion by thinking of writing uh, Pythonic code and, and working with these ideas of Pythonic code as empathetic ways of working with your coworkers. All right? How many of you came from a language like C or Java or C Sharp? A decent number, right? When you first learned Python, you probably thought it was this really simple thing that you could learn right away, like, oh, I spent a weekend, now I know Python, right? You now know how to do things in Python, but you don't know Python, right? And so a lot of these ideas are sort of algorithms or ways of working that you might come from another language and then write code that way until you know better, all right? So these are ways that you can help your coworkers or maybe yourself become a little bit better at writing Python the way it was meant to be written. So let's start by just defining, you know, what is Pythonic, right? This is the question people often ask when they come to Python. Like, I hear this term Pythonic, I know it means it's better, but what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so every language has idioms or ways of writing code that is sort of accepted by the community, right? There's many ways to write programs and uh, implement algorithms and so on, but there are ways that are more right and there are ways that are less right for the particular language you're working with. And for Python, I think it's especially important because it's such a simple and readable language that when you use it wrong, it stands out more, I guess, rather than say, let's say C, right? So when we write code that embraces these idiomatic ways of working, that's what Pythonic code is, right? So when you write code like this, there's many, many advantages to it. First of all, you're taking advantage of thousands of very smart developers, years of experience. And I say thousands, not millions, even though there are millions of Python developers, not every one of them is sort of contributing back to open source, contributing back to the community, but at thousands, hundreds of thousands, I don't know. But it's really great to leverage what has worked for these experienced developers. Okay, so when you take advantage of these idioms of the language, you're working the way that these people have found to be the best. You're also writing code that is expected by Python and it's tuned to run that type of code, right? You could create a sublist by slicing or you could create a sublist with a for loop. Slicing is probably better, it's expected by the language, things like that. Now I say C Python, not general Python, because there's Iron Python, Jython, PyPy, Python.net, MicroPython. There are many things, and I'm not necessarily saying it's optimized for all of those, right? Although they all have some similarities, but certainly C Python, the main one. It's also important that it's easily read and understood. So when you see common patterns, right? Oh, I see this list comprehension. You immediately know what the intent of that whole block of code is before you parse all the symbols, right? But if you do something non-Pythonic, you have to like go through and analyze how that code works, right? So that's not so great. It's often cleaner and simpler. So. What I'm gonna show you now is a bunch of examples of how code gets simpler and easier, probably faster, things like this. Now these are all the obvious benefits. These are like your benefits when you write more idiomatic Python. However, there are broader non-obvious or, or less obvious things as well. For example, if you run an open source project, it's easier to get people to contribute to your project if it doesn't look like a big mess, if it looks like nice code. If you're like, oh, if I, if I work with this project, I'm working on some amazing code by smart people. You know, one, like the, probably the example that stands out strongest is PyPI, right? You know, the thing you use when you say pip install a thing, that has been around for many, many years, and it's had traditionally a hard time of getting uh, contributors. The reason is it's not built on the traditional one, not built on Flask or Pyramid or Django or any of those things. It's just some like homegrown HTTP listener socket thing. And it's, it's basically like thousands of lines of code in one file. And people come along to contribute to PyPI uh, and make it better. And they're like, whoa, 
I don't actually don't want to work on this. This is a mess. I'm out. And so they're actually reworking this. It's a major project uh, at PSF to recreate PyPI. And now you have PyPI.org, and they're finally starting to move that over. That's written in Pyramid and using modern idioms. And guess what? They have more contributors. The exact same story applies to you if you work at a company, right? You want to keep your best developers? Don't make them work on crappy code, right? Let them work on amazing projects. And so this works either open source or closed source. Uh, there's the same benefits, I think. All right, common question always in these talks, can I get the code that you're going to write? Yes, you can get the code. It'll be at github.com slash Mike C. Kennedy, and then stuff after that. All right, I'll put this back up later. All right, are you ready? What I hope to do is just show you a bunch of examples that are you can take as a broader inspiration. We're not going to touch on everything that might or might not be Pythonic, but we'll start with some real simple examples, and we'll get increasingly advanced to stuff that probably a lot of you have not used, probably not seen, maybe. OK, so let's start something real simple, string formatting. How's that? Good? You guys like it? Is it going to run? It's going to run badly. Type error, but I mean, technically it runs. So it'll run. It'll say, no, age is a integer. You can't even do this. So we fix this, of course. Stir int, much better. <laughs> All right, this is good. No, this is not good. Uh, this is the kind of code you might write if you came from, say, JavaScript or C Sharp or something. You try the top one. It doesn't work, so fine, we'll do the bottom one. I guess Python's a crappy language. That's how we have to do it. No, it's just doing it wrong. All right, so you can use the old, uh, older style percent format as well. But certainly today, this is sort of outdated in, in the modern Python sense. But this, this still is kind of OK, but I, I wouldn't say that it's so great. So what do we do? Well, a lot of it starts with string up format, right? So here we can format the name and the age, get this to come out. It's great. Um, if you don't care, if you, you don't care about reordering it, you can just put curly curly. You don't have to say 0, 1, the name, nothing like that. This is great. If you want to do uh, repetition or reordering of the arguments, you can say 1, you know, hi, my name is curly 1. You're, uh, hi, I'm curly 1 years old. My name is curly 0. Yeah, curly 1 years old, things like that. That's pretty nice. If you have a dictionary or you want to use keyword arguments, you can do a little better. You can say format and give it. Uh, either a dictionary that you're expanding the keywords or just keyword arguments. And then you can say, on curly day, I was working at curly office. And this is really nice because, at least with the keyword argument version, you can test that it's working, right? Uh, it's very easy to read. However, all of these things have been replaced by F strings. How many of you use F strings? Uh, for the record, about a third, I would say. So very cool. These are great, right? So with F strings, we have the shortest way, right? You just say F, quote, and then in the curly braces go arbitrary Python expressions. Here you can see we have curly name, and we have curly age plus one. Like next year, I'll be that, right? So this is really cool because the linters can say, actually, that age is not defined. It's called years or something like that, right? So you can actually check that the formatting is going to work. All right, so here's a real simple example of how you might start out, how you might get better. Okay, these also happen to be the most high performance way to create Python strings as well. So, very good. All right, merging dictionaries. Let's, let's take a, a scenario, some kind of web app. I, I've got a web app, and data is coming into your application from multiple locations. You have the URL, which has the route in it, you know, like my server slash user slash seven, right? That seven is passed as like, say, a user ID or just ID here. Uh, in the query string, you might have question mark, ID equals something. In the form post, you have data coming back. So you want to just create like one source of truth. Like, okay, well, if these are all these different places I can get this information, let's create one dictionary that's like the answer. And we want to have a priority here. We want to have route have the highest priority. Something appears there first. We want the data to be there. Uh, query to have the lowest, lowest, because people can just put question mark junk on the end and mess with your site. And post is in the middle. So how do we do that? Well, it's cool. We write some loops. We're going to create this new dictionary. We're going to go through first the query, copy the values over, then the post to copy the values over, and then the route and copy the values over. And because the order, we have the ID that showed up in the query is being overwritten by the one in route. So we have our priority, right? Pythonic? Not Pythonic. Nah. 
So there's a couple of uh, ways we could do it. Obviously, there's update and copy. So I could go and create this M1, and I could say M1 update with the query, update with the other. But there's actually a better, shorter way we can do this. We do that. How many of you are familiar with that expression? And 20, 25%. Okay, so this does exactly the same thing. It recreates a new dictionary called M1, copies all the values for query over, copies all the values for post over, and route, and the thing that goes at the end has priority over the thing that goes before it. So exact same thing, much, much simpler, right? Okay, so those are interesting. Speaking of dictionaries, uh, uh, something closely related to them are these keyword arguments. So here we've got, we're going to connect to our database, and let's see, we're going to give it a few pieces of information. We're going to give it the username, the server, whether it should use replication, and whether it should use SSL. So we're going to call it down here, connect, M. Kennedy's the user, DB server is that. Yes, use SSL, true, use replication, false. Or wait, is it the other way around? Which, which was it? Was that a problem? Why is my company in the news as losing all its data? So that's, that's okay some of the time, but like the last two true false values, which is which? It's not totally obvious. So we could write this slightly differently. It's a little longer, but super obvious, right? We could say user is mkennedy, server is that, replicate is that, use SL is that. Oh, okay, well, let's switch those maybe. I don't know. Have to decide what you really want. This is cool that we can do it, and we've been able to do it for a long time. Did you know that you can force people to do this? So we rewrite that function above, and we put that little star right there. That tells Python, you must write the bottom one. That's an error. That's fine. How many of you guys know that star did that? 20%. Is that the same 20% every time? You guys are awesome. OK. <laughs> So this is really cool. You can say, this function is so super important. I want you to call it that bottom way. And if I try to do it the, the, the way where I don't use the keyword arguments, it says, you passed four positional arguments to this method. Zero were expected. Error. Right? Really cool. OK, so this, this little star of required keyword arguments is super awesome. All right. Here's a function that defines the Fibonacci numbers. Any algorithm in computer science has to somehow involve the Fibonacci numbers, right? One, one, two, three, five, eight, and so on. So there's a problem with this, though, right? It's not entirely accurate. How many numbers are in the Fibonacci numbers? Infinite, right? How many are here? Not infinite. Well, the problem is if I try to pass some kind of infinity or something really, really big for limit, it's going to take that nums list and it's going to just keep filling it up until you run out of time, you run out of memory, something like that. Okay? So we can obviously fix this by turning to a generator. Now we have an infinite version of it that is actually much more high performance than it was before as well. You guys use yield? Yield, yeah? Awesome. I'd say about half. Yield is awesome. So this is really great. Sometimes, though, you want to do recursion. So if I'm working with like any kind of tree data structure, a really natural way to work with it is through recursion. So here I have a function called get files. Take in a folder, it'll get all the files and then look for files in the subdirectory. And notice down below, it's actually calling itself again, but with the subdirectory, not the top level directory. All right? That's all good. And this is a generator, so it's super efficient. However, you can also, as of, uh, you can also use uh, yield from. Right, so yield from says, here is a generator, take all of the items and give it back. So what we're saying in the first part is, well, if it's a file, here's an item from the collection I'm looking for. Here's an item that goes in my collection. When you get to yield from, you say, here's a bunch of items in my collection, just add them all to what's getting returned. Apparently my mouse is tired. Okay, so yield from, really cool thing. All right, so there's these three, these, sorry, these four were the first four because they have an interesting common thread between them all. The common thread. So the common thread is that they're all only t available to you in Python 3. Right? Not legacy Python, modern Python. So there's been many examples of, I would love to use this library, but it's only available in Python 2. These I propose to you, like, these are amazing language features that are only available to you if you switch to Python 3. And I think this is the move that's actually kind of, the momentum is already going, it's going downhill, but I just wanted to point this out as well. All right, a couple others. Suppose I have an iterable or, or some kind of thing that is not 
not a list, so I can't call len on it, okay? So here I'm going to like a data layer, I'm saying give me all the measurements that are higher than 70, I get like something back that I can loop over, but it's not a list, so len doesn't work. So how do you count those? Yeah, make a loop. It's what I didn't see, it was fine. Totally awesome. So we could create this number, we could loop over it, it will add up. You don't even have to worry about whether it's a short, an enter, a long, it's gonna overflow, none of that stuff, it's fine, right? Well, there's a better way. What if I have this, and I can do it in one line? I come over here and write a little inline generator that says I'm gonna sum up the number one for each item, and by the way, Python makes me put a thing there, but I don't care about it, so I'm gonna put underscore, right? And in Python, when you have an argument that you don't care about and you wanna tell Python, I don't care about you, but it has to go here, underscore, right? Really, really nice feature. Okay, so this is good. Let's talk about slicing. Slicing is amazing. It's something fairly unique to Python and so on. So let's go back to our, our finite Fibonacci thing. We're gonna turn the list and I'm gonna get a bunch back. Maybe I only want the first five. So we can write this cool little code here. Go to the, call the function, bracket, you know, either zero or nothing, colon five. It gives me a sub list, zero, uh, one, one, two, three, five. Cool, right? What if it's a generator? And I try the same thing. Good? No good. No good. A lot of thumb down. Generator object has no attribute un under get item. That's a bummer. I thought slicing was cool and I could do this, but apparently it's only sort of cool. Well, iter tools bring slicing back for generators and other things that don't have a len on them, right? So if you want to do the same thing as we did before, you can just import iter tools and say I slice. And what do you get back? Same thing. Cool, right? Okay. So where, where does this inspiration for what is Pythonic come from, right? I gave you sort of some of the benefits at the beginning, but many people point to the Zen of Python by Tim Peters. And they'll say, well, if you don't really know what you should do, you should just type import this. And you get this. Like, this is literally what comes up, right? This is awesome. Uh, another amazing thing you can type is import anti-gravity. I don't know if you've ever done that. You need to do that. But this, this is more applicable right now. So import this, and it says a few things, like special cases aren't special enough to break the rules. Right, that's good. That means we kind of decide upon one way of doing things and so on. Although practicality beats purity. So these are, this is a bit of a tension, like don't do this except for when you should do it. Um, okay, so I'll show you, I'll leave you guys with one final example of where, where you might make this trade-off and where you might think about making this trade-off. All right, so there's this really cool uh, blog post that came out a while ago called Hacking Python's Memory with Slots. How many of you know what Dunder Slots means? Uh, this is the, uh, 10, 15%. Okay, so this is really amazing. It's definitely a way to break the rules, but to break them in an interesting and productive sense. So there's this company that does hotel sort of recommendations and travel stuff called Oyster. I'd never used them, but they have a cool blog post. So they were running all sorts of caching and stuff on their servers, and their servers were using about 25 gigs of RAM. And then they said, oh, and we changed this one line of code and we saved nine gigs of RAM per server and it was faster. I'm like, oh, what was that one line? Because that's kind of cool, right? All right, so let's go, let's go fool around with this for a bit. How are we doing on time? I got a few minutes, this will work. So every bit of code that you saw us write, uh, saw me talk about rather, is available. Like here's the string stuff, uh, here's the dictionary stuff. So this will all be in the repo, but the part I want to focus on is this last one here. So the idea is we've got a traditional class, which I'm calling a mutable thing. Not super interesting, but it has a initializer. It takes four arguments. It stores them right there. Yeah, totally standard. However, when people come to Python from languages, really especially the compiled languages like C++ or Java or .NET or something, this, this expression here is is mysterious, like what does this mean? You're assigning to a variable, the variable doesn't exist, but after this it does. Of course there's this convention of creating things like this. But if you come over here and you make a class, 
and you define a dunder net for it. Like that, and you create one of them. Let's call there's a, a little a. Um, oh, yes, of course. One, two, three. And let's do a little b. We'll put a different value there. That really just routes under to the dictionary, right? Pretty straightforward. Yeah, I can. Just a second. How's that? So. We have this dictionary, but this little b also has this dictionary, right? But the thing is, they're not the same. Every time you instantiate an object, you're instantiating the dictionary, and the keys are copies of the fields. Yeah? That's fine. That lets me go along and do things like this. Now I can make it dynamic and add stuff to it. However, if I'm not going to do that, and I'm going to have millions of those in memory, would I want copies of the fields in memory millions of times? Probably the answer is no. So basically, that's what slots is. It's a way to say, these are the fields. I'm not going to change them. Please don't make copies of the name all the time. There's going to be these three values or, or whatever. OK, so here's a traditional class, which I'm calling a mutable thing. And then there's this one. All that I've changed is that little bit right there. It has dunder slots set to the four values. And check this out. If like, I take away this D, you can see there's an error right here. You can't assign to this because you've declared it only has three things, A, B, and C, and there's no D, and there's no way to add a D. Okay? And there's a runtime error like, no, you can't add a D. It has slots. Don't do that. Okay, so this literally line 26, that's the line. And the assumption is I cannot do that a.fun equals true retroactively. I have to agree upon what goes in it. That, that's how most code works. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a bunch of data, a bunch of these objects. How many? Check this out. This is kind of cool. Let's put the underscores here. All right, this is a Python 3.6 thing, I think. So we have a million. And we're going to create a million of them. And we're going to use first a tuple, which is OK. Way better is a named tuple. Then we're going to create uh, the regular class. And finally, we're going to create the one that has the slots. We're going to look at two aspects. How long does it take to run? How much memory does it use to do that? Okay. All right, so let's, let's go ahead and run this first one here. And it's running, and it ran in half a second. So I'll keep a little, uh, little history here for you. Uh, tuple. 0.5 seconds, you know, that's all right. And let's see how much memory it has. That's not running. So we'll come down here. We'll come down here and we'll say Python. Spelling is hard. OK, so 209 megs. Let's just do it real quick for the others. Let's go down and say, you know what? Tuple is fun. But we all know that named tuples are way better. What's the trade-off here? All right, it ran in 1.4 seconds. So three times slower, granted, a million items, that's a ton. Name tuples equals 1.5 sec. And memory, 216. A little bit worse, but not too bad. I'm willing to make that trade-off if I get better usability, and so on. How's it work for a regular class? Let's try it on this one. This is like just no-nonsense standard Python class. Uh, about the same amount of time. However, in memory, 293. So class, 1.5. Memory is 293. Uh, 293. Now, final thing in this presentation. Put some numbers today. <laughs> Will it be faster, do you think? Significantly, not significantly? How many people say much faster? OK, 40%. I'm going to take the opposite to mean not so fast. So, so we'll go for speed. Memory, it seems like it's going to be better, right? If we don't create 1 million extra dictionaries with four keys in it, 
It seems like that's less memory if we just don't do that. So that's interesting. But think about like what would be the most efficient representation? It's got to be like the non-named tuple, right? I mean, it can't. How can you get better than the non-named tuple? All right, let's run it. Um, 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 um. And time a little faster, so you're both right. That's awesome. And over here for memory, we have 201, which is less than even the name tuple. All right. So here's one of these, although practicality beats purity, right? It's, you probably shouldn't do this slots thing almost ever. But if it'll like let you run half as many servers, maybe you should do it every now and then, right? Things like that. All right, so this was just uh, in sort of a exploring the whole import this. All right. So all you got to do, dunder slots, name the things, off it goes. And there is no dunder dict, right? There would be like an attribute error or something if I tried to print that out. There's no dunder dict. All right, so that's it, guys. If you want to get more stuff like this, listen to my podcast, Talk Python. The, uh, the source code is up already. I'll zoom in on that. I actually have a course at talkpython.fm slash pythonic that has like 52 of these things, so if that's interesting, check that out. And we'll do like that. And I guess we'll open up to any questions. It looks like there are questions. If I went over, then let's not do questions. Do that after. Does it do optimization if we do underscores a variable name? Not that I know of. The only thing that I know that it does if you use two underscores, it will name mangle it so that it is effectively private within that module, but uh, not, not otherwise, yeah. OK, next question. Uh, what do you think about type hinting, as in MyPy? Will it improve quality of Python libraries in general? Um, do you think it will be used broadly? I think type hinting is awesome. I was a little skeptical of it at first, but just for everyone who's following along, I've got some function. It takes a thing A and a B. Like, what is that supposed to do? Right, I have no idea. But we could come along here and say, you know, actually, that's an integer. And that is actually a list of strings, strings, and it returns a list of strings. Right? And if you were to go call that function, you hit dot. Uh, wait, well, I probably should put that in the right order, huh? And I'm going to go and hit dot. It'll give me all the list stuff. And it'll also tell me, no, that two is supposed to be like this. Actually, no, that two is supposed to be in quotes. OK, cool. I think I would say use it judiciously, but I think it's going to be actually a really important tool for transitioning from Python 2 to Python 3. And things like MyPy are making that pretty interesting. Next question, uh, aren't those f strings, asterisk uh, functions, and other uh, and such against the readability counts golden rule? They are somehow magic? Uh, well, they are definitely magic. That, that's true. Um, and I don't know why this is here, because that is actually not supposed to be that way. So they are somewhat magic compared to, say, the traditional one. But like, if I had to pick, say, line 17 or line 24 as more readable, I think 24 is definitely more readable. So it's, it definitely is less readable in the sense that you might not be familiar with them, and so they're kind of weird. But take away the newness, I think the F strings are more readable. And they're faster. Um, isn't it possible that some of these Python 3 only features will eventually be backported into Python 2? So what will be backported to Python 2? That's a pretty interesting question. Some of them have. For example, xrange is there, right? Um, Guido is adamant. Guido Van Rossum is adamant there will not be a Python 2.8. And so, I mean, every conference I see him at, he's got a giant, like, 2.8 with a cross through it. So I. It's possible, but I don't think all of them will, uh, especially the language features, right? Because if you port those back, that really means you have to change Python, not some library you can add. Um, 
somebody I think may have added, gosh, what was it? It was like F strings or something surprising back to Python 2 with a library. So it's possible. I, I think the path is really forward on Python 3. So I, to, to me, it's somewhat irrelevant. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think that you may see some of them backported as, as third party libraries, but not, yeah. it's not going to happen. It, not with the, the core developers are all in on Python 3. Yeah. Well, that's all the questions. Um, so thanks very much. Everyone all give right. them a, a big applause. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>